Hello everyone, welcome to our World War II Virtual Family Day. I'm Glenn Kyle, and for this segment, I want to share with you some items from the World War II home front. Now, as I've said to many of you before, museums tell stories about the past through objects, through material culture. That's one of the, the things that museums were founded to do. So what I have here is a box of stuff. Right, I have a box here of a lot of very interesting items from the home front. These are all original. These are all from the period. And I'm just kind of going to start pulling stuff out and sort of share with you the things that are, that are in the box. We may not make it all the way through. Uh, Libba says that I'm not able to stay here for the next four hours and tell you about everything in the box in detail. But I'm going to go through it and just give you a taste of some of the things you would have seen on the home front in World War II. Now, let me start off with one of the most meaningful and common sites that you would see on uh, the American home front. This, of course, is a Sun in Service banner. This is a, the Blue Star. This would be hung in a home, in a business, anything like that. And a Blue Star would indicate that there is someone from that family on active service in the military uh, serving, serving the country during World War II. And... Different, you know, if you saw, if you drove by a house and saw two or three blue stars, that means that family is committing a lot of its its members to the war effort. Some businesses would have larger banners made so that all the employees would be represented by a blue star. If you see a gold star, what that means is someone in that house has lost their life in the service of their country during the war. So anytime you see a gold star, that means that a sacrifice would have been made and, and you would know to to treat that house, that family with a great deal of, of respectful sorrow. And there's an organization uh, that, that came from this called the Gold Star Mothers, and it was a, a group of mothers that sort of formed a society so that they could, you know, comfort each other and, and have someone to talk to for those who had lost uh, sons, uh, nephews, fathers, husbands, things like that in the service. So these, these sudden and service banners are something that was very, very common but they really represent a big part of what it was like to be on the home front. Let's see. So we have here, and I'm just going to go through this stuff like I said. We have here a copy of the President's D-Day Prayer. On D-Day, FDR went on the radio, did a national broadcast, and offered a, a prayer to support the American, excuse me, the Allied landings in Europe. And uh, it, was, it was so popular, so well received and listened to that they created print copies that could be distributed and even, you know, mailed to someone, mailed to a loved one if you did not get to hear it on the radio or you wanted a, a commemorative copy of it yourself. This is a really neat piece. Um, the United States produced a lot, a lot of paper, pamphlets, booklets, paraphernalia, manuals, things like that during the war because they wanted everyone on the home front to get into the war effort. Now this one's relatively self-explanatory, make, do, and mend. This shows you how to make, do, and mend your own clothing. If you get a, a you know, today our clothing is almost disposable. If we get a, a bad hole in a set of our, our pants or, you know, tear in a shirt, we just throw it away and buy a new one because they're cheap and plentiful. Not so in the olden days, and certainly not so in wartime. You did not want to waste anything. So there were books for people who may not know how to repair a, a torn sleeve or a, or a hole in their britches or anything like that. So this book would be available to help people make their clothing last as long as it could. It's got detailed instructions. It's got you know guidelines on how to, to hem things, how to iron things. A really, really neat piece, and I also love, notice the patriotic coloring and the patriotic illustrations. You're going to see a lot of this as we go through this home front collection. Now, this is something really neat, too. This is uh, a ditty bag. This is made by the Red Cross. It's just a, a plain old cotton canvas bag. Uh, it's made with a, a drawstring in the side, and it was issued... Uh, given away to soldiers so that they could keep their personal gear, things in it like that. And lots, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these were made during the war by Red Cross volunteers. What's really neat about this one is that, I don't know if, how far you can zoom in, this one was made by the Atlanta, Georgia chapter of the Red Cross. So just down the road from Gainesville here, 
we have this item that was made by the Red Cross and was made to be given to soldiers as a, as a, you know, as a form of comfort and things like that. So another really neat piece that would end up on the front lines but is a representation of what folks on the home front could and would do. Here we have a, a small USO banner, United uh, Services Organization. The GIs loved to get their entertainment, and so the USO was set up as a way to raise morale on the, on the front lines, and they recruited very heavily on the home front, and most of your major singers, movie stars, actors, athletes, things like that would go on a USO tour at some point, and the USO is still around today providing a lot of different things. Now, here's a, here's a dirty secret. Uh, this did create some rivalries between certain organizations like the USO and the Red Cross. Uh, soldiers and sailors tended to like the USO a lot more because when they pr would provide donuts and coffee, they gave it out for free. The Red Cross actually charged uh, for the donuts and the coffee, and the soldiers didn't think that was that fa was fair, but that was the way the Red Cross was able to fund a lot of the things they did. But if you have two lines somewhere, a USO line and a Red Cross line, you're going to get in the line with the free stuff. And so the USO tended to be much, much more popular. Here is a really neat thing. You see all kinds of these things. These were sold stateside. There were, again, there were millions of men that went into the service, and, and, and quite a few women too. And they wanted to provide uh, souvenirs to their family. And so all these bases would sell these, these uh, friendship pillows, uh, you know, lovers' pillows, things like that. And they could, and they would usually from uh, the, the base where they were at, these were mass produced, and then the bases and the forts would just stamp their name on it. You see here, this is Lawson General Hospital. This is a unit that was actually raised around Emory University and went overseas. But um, these were sent home, and the idea was they would make something nice for the mom or the fiance or the wife they could display in their home. And so you can see this is really generic. There's an anti-aircraft gun over on one side. We've got machine guns over on the other. We've even got some airplanes in case this goes to a, a, an air base. We've got a field gun. We've got some artillery. We've got tanks. We've got bombers. And like I said, this was a hospital unit, right? And, you know, oh, and then the friendship, oh, the world is wide and the world is grand and there's little or nothing new. Let's see, can't quite make that out on, on my fold. But she... Oh, but, uh, let's see, but she... Let me look at it. But, but she is a sweet thing. But the sweetest thing is the girl of the hand of the friend that's tried and true. So these were kind of sappy. They were very colorful, but they were very, very popular. You see a lot of these left over, which kind of makes me think that all the GIs that sent these home to their loved ones, were the loved ones really that interested in them? Did they go, oh, that's nice, and just stick it in a drawer as a keepsake? I don't know. We've got some other fun stuff here. Of course, kids on the, you know, children on the home front want to be a part. They want to, they, they reenact, they play the things that they read about, see about, hear about. And so toy soldiers, toy trucks, um, ships, things like that were incredibly popular during the war. And even though there was a war on, and they tended to try to keep most of the metal, a lot of these are made out of metal that is not that important, like, you know, just junk metal or, or cheap metal. This is not even a lead soldier. This is just um, like pop metal. And the designs are not really necessarily based on anything. I mean, no tank in the world ever looked like this, right? But it gives kids something that they're able to play with and they can they can build their own fleets they can pretend if if dad or you know a big brother or something is on a ship at sea this is going to allow them a connection to that family member that they might not otherwise get so so toys continue to be a very very important part of, of growing up and childhood on the american home front but Toy ships and, and big ships are, are different things. This is this is one of my favorite things. This is uh, this is from the the USS Atlanta, the 
Uh, the CL-51 was a light cruiser that was named for the city of Atlanta and was built in, it was launched in 1942 and it took part in several battles including the Battle of Guadalcanal and it was sunk in action on the night of November 12, 13, 1942. And the city of Atlanta started a, a bond drive to raise more money to build a new Atlanta. So the, And so this, this picture you see here is of the CL-51 and this was started by, you know, this was Margaret Mitchell uh, was, a, was a big mover in this. The mayor of Atlanta, Hartsfield, was a big mover in this. And so when people would contribute to this cause to build a new Atlanta, they would get a certificate. So you can see this one went to an entire business. And you see these certificates, that means that somebody gave to build a new USS Atlanta. And what's really cool about this one, this is why I have this one framed this way, you have all the names of the guys who were at the company who contributed to the bond drive for a new Atlanta. And there's a lot of names on here. Right? And so they did, the, just the city of Atlanta and surrounding areas, raised enough money to not only build a cruiser, but another half of a cruiser right, during the war. And by, and by 1945, very early 1945, a new Atlanta was launched and um, did take its place in the Pacific Fleet and continued the war on until, until the war was finished. So that's a really neat aspect. I've met several folks who were on the USS Atlanta when they commissioned that ship. They did something really interesting. If you signed up for the Navy and you were from Atlanta, you could request to be put on the Atlanta. So the USS Atlanta, when it went overseas, the, this is the, the early one, there were a lot of guys from, from Atlanta and, and Georgia on that ship. And so when the ship got sunk, not only was it a matter of, of city and state pride that this ship had been lost, a lot of people lost loved ones too. Let's see. I think this is, yes. So I mentioned war bonds. Um, this is, I've got, this is a, a reproduction here. I've got a real one and we'll get down to here in a second. But people had war bonds. The, the government needed to raise money for the war. They, they, they you know, wars cost money, folks. Uh, it's in any basic history book or economics book. And they had to raise the money to do it. And so they sold war bonds. Uh, someone could save up. They would, this was the most common uh, denomination. It was a $25 bond. It cost you $8.25. Excuse me, $18.25. And when you paid at the, the bond place, $18.25, you took this home. And at the end of the war, you could turn it in and get $25 back. This is, in effect, a way of the United States government able to take out a series of about 10 to 20 million small loans to finance the war effort. And these were everywhere. There were songs about bond drives. There were bond drives in every big town and every little town. And so when people would get these bonds, they would... They would put them all together because this, this is an investment, right? You're going to get more money back than you put in. And so they're going to, to put these together. Uh, and you're going to keep notes of your bonds and, and when they mature and things like that. And they're all going to go in this one bond booklet. And those bond booklets were, were very, very common things. This is, <laughs> this is really neat. Again, when the war started... Most of industry shifted away from consumer goods and went into the production of war material. And that means that heavy household appliances, such as refrigerators, <clears throat> that you're not going to get uh, another refrigerator until the war is over. So you have got to make anything you get last. Uh, and repairmen are going to be more scarce because repairmen have been placed into heavy industry to repair, you know, tanks and airplanes and things like that. So this... There are lots of booklets that came out on the home front that show you different ways. Again, make, do, and mend. They're stretching your clothes to last longer. Here's a book telling you how to make your refrigerator last a lot longer because, again, you're not going to get a new refrigerator until the war ends or a new radio. Um, so, I mean, even, even here on the back, you know, because of the part they play in protecting the nation's food and health, 20 million mechanical refrigerators are making a major uh, major contribution to the war effort. Your refrigerator, ladies and gentlemen, is helping us win this war. Buy war bonds and stamps for victory. 
those, those ads were everywhere. Now, this is a great booklet. You see that this is something that they would give away at, at seed companies and things like that. Victory Gardens were such a central and important part of the American experience during World War II. Food that you grew at home, uh, food was rationed, right? Any processed food was going to be rationed, and we can get into some of those ration books in a little bit. But food that you grew your, yourself in your home or, or on your plot of land was not rationed at all. And so it was very much encouraged for folks to grow their own food, grow for victory. This is an idea that started back in World War I, but in World War II it really took off, and the government supported it with lots of free pamphlets and how-to manuals, um, they made it so that even though canners uh, took up a lot of metal, you were able to get canners and glass jars for the war so that you could can the food. And remember, there's a lot of people that live in cities. Not everyone's a farmer in 1941, so people have to learn this. And people would have victory gardens from the size of their entire backyard to people who lived in cities would have little boxes out on the windowsill just so that they could grow something and both literally and ideologically contribute to the war effort. So you have entire booklets like that. Again, the United States printed a lot of books during the war. Um, and there's how to, how to, how to plant different crops together, how far apart to put your, your rows, uh, what kind of seeds work best in what climates, at what time of year, how to recognize a weed from a plant. This, this great book goes into a ton of detail. And what's really interesting is it looks kind of dense, and it is, but this book is written in such a way so that if you didn't know the first thing about growing vegetables, you could pick up this book, you could get a shovel and a few packs of seeds and a bucket and go into your backyard and start growing your own food, your own food just, just from getting this booklet. And it's really neat. And again, when you start talking to folks who are around in World War I, if they were in, the, you know, in an urban area or in a suburban area or even a lot of rural areas, Almost everyone had some kind of victory garden going on on their property, no matter how big or small. It was a big part of America's war effort and a big part of America's memory after the war. But it wasn't, it wasn't all home stuff, you know. So here is an entire booklet about farmers in the war. People got people to gotta eat food, right? They, they have to have that food that's rationed. And so this basically... It's from the Office of Price Administration, the OPA. They're the ones who set what prices would be. And this is a booklet that's specifically to farmers, basically letting them know how they're going to be able to contribute, um, how they can access products that may be rationed to other people, uh, how to deal with the price differences, um, their role legally uh, and ethically in preparing for the war, um, You know, showing how things may not, it, the price may go up on things, but it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. You see here a comparison, barbed wire prices in two wars. Look how much barbed wire cost in World War I compared to World War II. We're keeping prices down for you and milk cans and things like that. And it goes through a lot of those different things. It's basically trying to say, you know, we are putting a lot of regulations on you, but it's not nearly as bad as it has been in the, plant, in the past please cooperate with us because we need your help in the war effort and we can't do this if you're going to be persnickety. So again, there's, there's just lots of information that goes out to all aspects of society. So here we've got some ration books, right? And the ration books are basically how you were able to get rationed goods. And as I said, processed food was rationed. Uh, anything canned, and they had books one, two, three, and four. I've got copies of one, two, and four that I just pulled out here. So basically, this is the for, you know the first year's rationing. America was kind of struggling to, to catch up, and so you would be each person would be issued one of these, uh, usually a month, and it would have inside of it. You see, these are mostly torn out. It would have your information in it, and it would have little stamps down here that you would have to pull out. And you, if you went to, say, buy, some, buy a, a piece of beef at the butcher, you had to not only have the money to pay for it, you had to have your coupon showing that you were allowed to buy meat this week. If you'd already used your coupon, you couldn't buy meat. That's how they rationed it. They prevented people from getting too much stuff all at once. 
So, you know, you if you had a family of four, you would get four of these books. You would be able to take the appropriate uh, coupons out and use them. But as you can imagine, this led to a lot of uh, a black market uh, stuff. There would be black market meat. There would be uh, they, people tried to forge ration books and coupons and things like that. They didn't have these these fancy colored laser printers now, so things weren't quite as easy in the 1940s as they would be today. But but even then, they had to get more complex. So this first year of the war, when America is just trying to get something done, you can see that this is this war ration book one for the first year of the war for 42 is actually just a sheet of paper that's been printed on one side and then has been folded over into the book. By the time we get to 1943, we've got, you know, actual books that are stapled together, they're produced, they have instructions, uh, they have official stamps that show that this is a real book and not just a, a, a forgery. And now, you can see this one, all the coupons have been used up in this one. It's really interesting when you start looking at ration books, if you collect these or look at them, the first three years of the war, those books are empty, right? Because people are, things are rationed. They're not able to get the things they need, sugar, uh, meat, canned goods, and things like that. When you get into war ration book four, let me see if I've got an example here. The war is all, this is, these are from 1945, right? America is doing much better. We've cranked up our production. Look at all the coupons left in this thing. You see war ration book four, a lot of them just have a ton of coupons left because people didn't necessarily need them, right? The war ends in Germany, in Europe in May, and in uh, the Pacific in, in September. So the war ration books early on are stripped bare usually. But food wasn't the only thing rationed. You also had gasoline rations and this is an, an a basic mileage ration you would you would get a sticker for your car uh, I've got an example of, of that in here somewhere and then you would get these little tickets All right here's an, here's another one from someone in Atlanta and the tickets would allow you each each week let's see if I can get this unfolded there each week you get five gallons of gas for your car per week. Now, that would not do today, would it? Uh, that is not per family member. That is that is per vehicle, and it's usually per household. Uh, there were different A's and B's and things like that. You know, a doctor might have a, a D sticker, which would allow him not quite, but almost unlimited uh, gasoline. And here's one of the interesting things: gasoline was rationed. Not because we were short of gasoline. We were the largest gasoline and fuel producer in the world at the time. But rubber for tires was incredibly rare. Mostly, before the war, it came from Indochina, which had been taken over by the Japanese. And the United States had to develop a way to create a synthetic rubber. But until they did, we had to preserve whatever rubber we had. That's why we rationed gasoline, so that folks would not use up their rubber on their tires, not because we were short of gasoline. It's the same th reason that sugar was rationed. Sugar was rationed not because we didn't have enough sugar, not that uh, Central and South America weren't producing enough for us, but how does it get here? It gets here on ships. And those ships need to be used to carry men and war material overseas, not to bring sugar to the home front for people's coffee. So the sugar was there, we just needed those ships for more important things. Again, the entire country was mobilized, and you see a lot of things on the people could put on their cars, on their doors, that are just things they would put up, right? We shared for our own and for our allies. This stuff is everywhere. There are posters, there are stickers, there are pamphlets that go in, in homes and things like that. Um, oh, here it is, I'm sorry. Here is an original A car. This, every car, I would say every, 95% of vehicles that you would see in World War II would have this in their front windshield an A gasoline ration. And again, five gallons a week. Um, you weren't supposed to trade. You weren't supposed to use yours for this and use yours for that. That means you had to save stuff up, right? You uh, public, public transportation blossomed during this area, especially in urban areas. Uh, so did the use of horses and buggies and wagons and things like that. Horses were not rationed. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, there were some guys, there was a great song. Uh, you may have heard the song, The Old Gray Mare Just Ain't What She Used to Be. During World War II, a song came out that was, The Old Gray Mare Is Right Where She Ought to Be. And the song goes on and talks about how the farmer's making a fortune because he's using his mule and buggy and wagon to tow cars that have run out of gas to the gas station. So, old ways sometimes are the best still. Talking to loved ones overseas was incredibly important. We want to stay in touch with our loved ones today. We have the ability to, to use our cell phone, send a text, an email, uh, a twit, uh, anything. Sometimes we might even sit down and write them a letter and send it through the post. But of course, World War II, that was the only way we could keep up with family members who were even in the country or loved ones overseas in the military. And writing a letter could be very, very emotional. Uh, getting one could be super inspiring or depressing, depending upon what was in the letter. But the, the, the American government and the Army and the Navy knew that maintaining communication with soldiers and their families back home was incredibly crucial. Well, America is the place of know-how, and we want to be able to keep that going as much as possible. And putting envelopes and letters and putting a stamp on them, that was fine. But that can get really bulky when you've got millions of people overseas and they each want a letter a week and they want to send back one a week. That's a whole lot of, uh, of ships and, and planes that are having to carry mail that should be carrying gasoline or men or ammunition or food or things like that. So the United States came up with this wonderful thing called V-mail, right? And you, could, you can see here, you could buy it in, in packs. And what this was is it was a way to create something that was technologically advanced. No other country did this or could do this. So what, would, what you would do is you would get your, your piece of email and you would open it up like this. And you can kind of see how that looks, right? You've got your, uh, you put it to who it's to up here and uh, who, it's, who it's from uh, over here. And then the sensor is going to have to put his stamp. This all still has to go through the sensors, right? You don't want sensitive information leaking out. And so then you're going to sit down and you're going to write the letter out on this. You're even going to use maybe your, your quink made for V-mail, right? This isn't any different necessarily than, than other uh, inks, but it's a great sales pitch because, you know, ink, this... Well, let me let me tell you how this happens, and let me then you'll understand why you need ink that can draw really dark. So what you do is you you write your letter on this, you fold it up like this, and you seal it up, and it goes to not overseas to your loved one. You put their address here, but it goes to a processing facility. And what the processing facility does is it takes all these, it lays out a whole bunch of them on one sheet, photographs them. And then they take that roll of film, stick it into a series of boxes. Those boxes go on the airplanes. They fly overseas. The, the film is taken out of the boxes. It is processed. And then you get a very, very small version of this that goes to the, the family member, right? So, and it's a, let's see. Uh, so, so then you would fold this up, and it would be uh, sent, photographed, sent overseas, and then this, you can see this picture here, this is what the actual recipient would get. It's only about three by five. It's much, much smaller than what you wrote, but this allows a lot of letters to fly much more efficiently, and because you can send them by airplane, it gets there a lot quicker. So the United States, po the post could move and the letters could move back and forth much quicker than if it was just a regular old stamp letter. Within one airplane, you could fit enough V-mails that would normally take 25 airplanes to carry by regular mail. So it's a lot more efficient. It's a complicated process, but it sort of creates a situation that a lot of other countries are jealous of. And it creates a situation that eventually people realize, well, maybe instead of just sending the images that we've photographed physically with film, what if we could transmit that somehow? And I don't know, maybe turn it into... A fax? That's another story. Now, um, there are just a couple of other things I want to talk to you about. 
uh, from the home front. And a lot of them are having to do with the factories and the work, right? You've, you've seen Rosie the Riveter. You probably just watched a special episode about Rosie the Riveter. And a lot of the places in, in uh, where did it go? Let's just, there we go. Uh, a lot of the factories would set up special newsletters for their employees. And working in the factories during World War II was also one of those crucial, central, and forever remembered aspects of the home front. People went in by the millions because America was the arsenal of democracy. We were able to outproduce almost every other country combined. That's allies and Axis powers. We just made the stuff. We made ships and planes and radios and helmets and, and, and all this stuff because industry was totally mobilized. And again, Americans love their, their newspapers. They love their booklets. And so I've got here a couple of really neat booklets. I've got some local ones too. Um, I've got this one here. This is a, a booklet, the Sow, the Sow Easter, which is uh, from the Brunswick shipyards down near Savannah. Uh, and they made Liberty ships. And you see one of the Liberty ships slipping off the dock there. Um, they're back in the Sixth War loan. And inside, it's just going to have news about, you know, it, it's going to highlight certain uh, workers who may have been a very, very productive member of their team that week. It's going to tell them where some of the ships that they're building or serving. It's just going to give them a lot of information and make them take a lot of pride in their work. Right? And, and they're, you know, they're, they're also going to be very inspirational. Pictures from around the, the shipyards and things like that. And then, of course, this is awesome on the back. Me quit, not till it's over, over there, right? And you can see it's one of those classic Rosies there with her welding helmet on. And they're not, they're, in other words, they're going to keep going. They're not going to stop. Now, this is a really cool one. I had, I just kind of happened upon this one. This is a Tornow. This is from a factory that was actually in Northeast Georgia and got an, an E award. And it made tractors for, among other things, it made tractors and heavy uh, equipment like that for the war effort. And this, like I said, this was right here in Northeast Georgia. And it's got sort of the same thing, you know, Puria shot made. Now, you know, this is, there was a, there were a couple of Tornow factories around the country, but there was one here. Um, and this has articles about what's going on in the different ones. And the the pic the see the picture on the front is actually of the one in Georgia, so if you want to, I don't know if you can zoom in on that. Um, the Georgia plant wins the E Victory Award, and and again you see how many people are there, making. Uh, there's a lot of women out front, a lot of folks that work in the factory. And for this photograph, they probably had the women come not in their work clothes. They said they're going to come and take a picture, wear your Sunday best. And something that a lot of these would have too is folks who had worked in the factory who may have joined the military and are serving in the military, they're going to have small bios of them to keep people, you know, because you, they're your workmates. You, you want to know what's been going on. Well, you know, John joined the Army. I wonder where, what he's doing now. They're going to have a lot of information about that so that you can keep up with your old workers. It's a way to know that what you're doing is actually an important part of keeping not only your country safe, but keeping them safe. So another aspect of the home front is um, blackouts and air raid wardens. Now, the United States, being separated as it is, with 3,000 miles of ocean on either side of us, was never really under threat from attack or invasion. That's one of the things that, that made us so strong and kept us so strong during the war. But early on, people were afraid that somehow, the, the, right, it was a scare. The Japanese or maybe even the Germans were going to be get bombers over here and bomb our factories, bomb our, our uh, homes, our, our towns, and things like that. So an air raid warden system was set up in the United States, The one, and it was based on the one in England. The one in England, of course, had been operating during the Blitz and was very effective and was very real. The ones here in the United States were never too terribly serious, especially as the war went on, but it was something 
that when people participated, they felt like they were taking part in something that brought the community together, and they felt like even if it was a small threat, that they were somehow united with their folks overseas. And so the Air Raid Wardens received a lot of instruction on you know, how, to, how to deal with incendiary bombs and you know, how to, to deal with neighbors who might not want to black out all their curtains, how to build an air raid shelter, uh, things like that. There's a, there's a great, yeah, there's a, there's a great picture here of, for blackouts, right? They're, they're, it's the air raid, air raid warden's job to make sure that the area is safe when a blackout happens. So they're painting white stripes on the curbs, on telephone poles, so that in low light conditions, people will still be able to see and drive during the blackouts. There's a, you know, there's a great scene in uh, It's a Wonderful Life when George Bailey is still on the home front. He's an air raid warden, and he's yelling at people to, to turn out their lights, even though you know Bedford Falls isn't in any danger of being bombed by the Germans, but it's still something that people did. This is another uh, great piece of the home front, and, and a lot of people, this isn't nearly as common now, perhaps unfortunately, but it used to be very common for folks to make their own clothes, and they would get patterns of things, and patterns have been around since, oh goodness, the, well, really since the 18th century here in America. They became very common and mass-produced uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and McCall's was one of those very popular companies that could provide patterns and people could make their own clothing. This particular pattern, this is really neat, a lot of folks who went into the nursing service would make their own clothing or, or served in the Red Cross, they would make them. And so McCall's decided to offer patterns that fit the uniform, the, the uniform, uniform measurements and patterns of the clothing. And so they would sell these in different sizes and you could look and see you know, if this was the right size for you, and you can make your own clothing. Again, this is a great way to not only make, do, and mend, but you're making your own clothing. You're not overburdening the production system or the supply system so that that can be focused on the war effort. There's, there's only one other thing I want to show you. Let's see if I can, yeah, here it is. If we can pull this in here. Again, another Georgia-focused thing. Cotton goes to war, right? There, like I said, there were all sorts of, of propaganda pieces. And, and when I say propaganda, it definitely has a negative connotation now. But, but the original definition of propaganda is basically information from the government, right? It's the, it's the information that the government provides. Now, the government, based on what the government is based on, is going to provide you with different aspects of information and different perceptions. But here in the United States, we were generally the good guys and we're trying to mobilize everything and let people know that the work they're doing is contributing to victory. Because if you're, you know, if you're young or if you're older and you're just working in the cotton fields and nothing seems to have changed between 1938 and 1942 and you wonder if, if what you're doing matters, things like this come out and can help you understand and appreciate and this was a piece that was very common here in the South, in Georgia, in Alabama, in Mississippi. Because when you think about the role of cotton in war, it is huge, right? It is making uniforms. It is making uh, rope. It is making the nylon equipment that, that folks use. And so this comic cartoon approach was really, really effective. It got a lot of information in a very, quite frankly, delightful way over to people and again it helped get the information out there that made everyone feel like they were a part of the war and that's an important thing to remember about the home front is it's an old tenet of military history and social history that that wars are won or lost in the will of the people who are carrying the war out it doesn't matter how good your soldiers do, are doing overseas if you don't have the support of the people at home the war's not going to have to succeed. And that is especially true in the modern democracies during World War II, such as France, Great Britain, and especially the United States. So the home front of World War II was a time not of perfect unity, but probably as close to unity as the country has seen in a, in a long time. Arguably the most unified part. Uh, men, women, uh, 
African American, white, these people came together and worked in ways because they knew they were fighting against an enemy who was not the best. They, World War II helps us because it's pretty obvious who the bad guys are, right? That doesn't happen as much now, and sometimes further back in our past, it's not entirely clear. But totalitarian governments are pretty bad people. They lead to bad things. And so they knew that this was a good war, a just war, and they wanted to play their part. And this is just a touch. This is just scratching the surface of the home front material culture that can help us tell some of those stories. And it's really fascinating because it gives us a look at what life would have been like, at the things we would have seen, at the attitudes we would have run into on that home front in the 1940s. And that was one of the most remarkable and unified times in the course of American history. That's generally because we knew what we were fighting for. World War II is generally considered a good war. It's a just war. The guys we were fighting against were bad. The the totalitarian governments of Japan and Germany were doing pretty awful things. And once we got into the war, we were in it all the way. And while there were sometimes a lot of differences in terms of how we should go about the war, in terms of what labor relations and rationing should actually focus on and accomplish during the war, by and large, the American home front was working towards one singular purpose, and a lot of these objects show that in great detail. They're they're so fascinating, and it's also really neat because so many people, and there's nothing wrong with this, I'm one of these people too, collect and focus on the military aspects of World War II, the the guns, the helmets, the uniforms, and information about the tanks and the planes. and That's really neat stuff. But this stuff tells you what life was like for most Americans, right? For, For almost all the women, for all the kids, for a lot of the men who stayed on the home front because their jobs were critical or, or they had a specific skill that was needed in manufacturing rather than in fighting, these items from the home front can really give a fantastic sense of what their perceptions were of the war, what they felt like they were contributing, what they felt like when they read the news or, or they went into work or, or they took part in a scrap drive or they bought a bond for a war bond drive. It's a really fascinating topic. There's lots more here I could go into, but I know we're running out of time. But I encourage you, there's lots available that's online. You can just look up home front items on Google and you're going to get a wide variety of a lot of neat stuff that I haven't even touched on today. So thanks for tuning in to this segment of our virtual World War II Family Day. We hope you've learned something. We hope it encourages you to dig deeper into the topic. And until we see you next time, I'm Glenn Kyle. Stay safe and take care. Uh